Arxan is now digital.ai. Join us at our booth in the virtual expo hall to learn how our app protection, white box cryptography, and threat analytics solutions can help you stay ahead of the evolving threat landscape. Good day. This is Purple Team Strategies for Application Security. My name is Joe Schottman. I'm a senior security analyst. When I was trying to figure out what to call this presentation, I searched and searched for a word that means to make something more purple. And it turns out that there actually is a word and it's empurpling. But that's a really terrible word, so I just decided not to use it. About me, I'm a senior security analyst for Truist, formerly bb t focused on application security. I've got a wide ranging background. I've worked in web application development. I've done DevOps and system administration. I've done all kinds of blue team things, but mostly focused on threat hunting and doing incident response. For the past few years, I've been really focused on application security and penetration testing. And I'm very enterprisey. So some of what I'm talking about may not make sense for your smaller organizations. I work in very large organizations that have hundreds of thousands or millions of users, hundreds of applications, and really, really large attack surfaces. And a large part of my work is figuring out how to cut down on our work and make sure that we've got all these nooks and crannies secured. But even if you're working for a relatively small group that doesn't have as big of a problem as we do, I think you'll find some of this useful. The obligatory disclaimer, I'm not speaking on behalf of Truist, bb t or any other entity. All opinions expressed are my own. So you're going to be seeing a lot of photos of this guy. And you may, if you're not familiar with the uh, immigrant punk scene, you may not be familiar, familiar with him. But this is Eugene Hoots, who is the lead singer of a group called Gogo Berdello. And they're most famous for a song called Start Wearing Purple. And I've thrown some pictures of him in. My natural inclination is to do really, really dull presentations where it's just text. And people like a little bit more excitement. And as you can see, he is a very evocative gentleman who is expressive with his face. So I chose some interesting photos to keep you guys engaged. The agenda for this talk, I'm going to give a kind of overview of what Purple Teams are and how they work. I'm going to touch briefly on DAST, Dynamic Application Security Testing, just in case you're not familiar with how those work. I'm going to talk about the specific problems I've encountered making DAST more purple and some of the ways to address it, and some general strategies for making application security more purple. I'm not really going to touch a lot on the CI dev up, DevSecOps type of work, but I'll, I will glance on it. So purple team in a nutshell. The offensive and defensive staff working together. It's realigning so that the techniques and strategies, the teams and incentives all drive the offensive and defensive teams working together with a singular goal of making the company or enterprise more secure rather than working within their narrow towers and maybe not being as effective as they could be working hand in hand. Blue teams often perceive in kind of adversarial relationship with the red team. There's this feeling that someone's gonna come in, find a vulnerability, kind of punch you in the face because you can't detect, block or mitigate it, and then go tell the senior management that there's a problem. So it's all about trying to avoid this for the most part. I'm gonna go ahead and do the thing that you're not supposed to do and just read the slide. This is a great quote from Daniel Meisler, who's one of the leading thought leaders in this space. A purple team is a function designed to enhance information sharing between and the ultimate effectiveness of an organization's red and blue teams. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be using red as generic offensive security. This could be DAS, the dynamic application scanning, the SAS, the source code scanning, things like Black Duck that look for open source vulnerabilities, anything that's like a more sophisticated pen test or red team engagement. And blue is just the defensive staff in general. This could be the security operations center staff, the people who work responding to alerts, could be the people who monitor and tune the firewalls and the web application firewalls. It could involve the threat intel groups, operations, the people who are running the systems, and the developers are even tied in as part of this. So it's you'll find different definitions of red and blue in different talks, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be using these. Some more de definitions. It's a collaborative effort between the defenders and simulated attackers to figure out how attackers can get in. The first step of any serious attack is getting, getting that foothold. And once you get the foothold, then they start looking around for what they can plunder on that system or start pivoting deeper and deeper into the system, into other systems. Using this strategy, you can start finding the ways that they get that initial foothold and cut them off. It's working to make sure that if they do get that foothold, you can detect them right after they occur. 
how to make sure that you can spot them after they started start pivoting from one system to another, or in some cases going from one level of access to another. It's timing them, making it harder because it, you cut down on what they can do inside the network and reducing the available tools that are on the system. So a purple team engagement might say, we found that Netcat was pre-installed in systems and I was able to use that to effectively pull in other tools. So unless there's this legitimate system reason why to have Netcat on that system, go ahead and pull it off. And it just generally increases the education and situational awareness of what goes on in the specific enterprise on both sides. So the blue team doesn't necessarily know what how attackers are going to be targeting them. The red team doesn't necessarily know exactly what's available, what targets are available, what weaknesses the blue team knows about. So by increasing the information sharing between the two teams, it, it lets both sides work more effectively. And the bottom line for management is it increases the return on investment that they put into both teams and it makes them both more effective using a feedback loop. So as an offensive security practitioner, I try to be very aware that simply finding vulnerabilities does not make the company more secure. It's the going through, I mean, going through and getting the vulnerabilities remediated definitely makes it more secure as well. But with the large attack surfaces in modern enterprises, it's not necessarily practical to do significant testing on every part of it. You have to make the blue team more effective at doing their job as part of testing. Things change rapidly with DevOps, things can change. You, new systems can be deployed in a matter of minutes. In some cases, companies are rolling out new code multiple times a day. There's simply no way that security can test every single bit of it. But what you can do is make the blue team more effective at detecting attacks by letting them know, know how things work. If you have what you consider to be a successful attack where you have found a vulnerability, if you haven't taken that as an opportunity to make the blue team more effective, to me, that's a failure. Pushing AppSec right, so the concept of pushing application security left into the CI pipeline and that sort of thing has been a huge buzzword in the industry, and I fully agree with it, and that's part of my work as well. But I also like the idea of pushing it right. So if left is the development cycle, right is people and operations actually running it. They're the last lines of defense. There's an old truism that an attacker only needs the defense to fail once to be able to get in, but at the same time, just getting in usually isn't the end goal. The attacker only needs to mess up once for the defensive side to find it also. So by helping provide the blue team with the skills to find it early in the attack phase, you can cut them off before anything significant happens. You don't necessarily want to ever tell your boss that, you know, a system was breached and they got a web show on, but that's a far better thing to tell them than say, they then got domain admin control and we're able to pivot throughout the entire network and exfiltrate all of our customer data. So part of the point of the concept, this entire concept, is moving application security specifically right into the area of the SOC work where typically I've found that there's not been great training and not, not great opportunities there. So purple is a spectrum, like the background of the slide. You don't have to do everything that I talk about to be called purple. You can come up with your own ideas to be called purple. It's all about going through and picking and choosing which parts of the concepts work for you, for your applications, for your staff, and choosing what's gonna be most effective. So I'm gonna do a little walkthrough with Eugene and Sergi. Eugene would be another man to know of the band. So in a more conventional purple team engagement, we have Sergi over here who is the penetration tester and he lets the blue team know that he just used a zero to a attack tool that just dropped, wants to know if there was any defensive capabilities spotting or mitigating it. Here we have our very stressed out SOC operator who responds and says, no, there was not actually visibility into it but now that they know that the issue exists and that there is an exploitable vulnerability within the system, they've gone ahead and deployed a detection pattern that should help. And in doing the research, he's also come up with some additional information that might be interesting to do in a retest of the, of the tool. As part of the feedback loop, he, the pen tester takes that additional tool that the defensive team found, applies it and runs the test again and double checks to see if it worked. Yet again, our SOC analyst working in direct communication with the pen tester can say, okay, that part worked and I've now enabled an additional feature in the in Based on that feedback, the defensive team can then say, okay, that encoding technique did or didn't work and perhaps enable an additional feature on the... Based on that additional feedback, the defensive team can then say, okay, that encoding did or didn't work and maybe enable an additional 
encoding tool to help be able to detect it. At the end of the day, the team working together has pulled off the performance and everyone takes a big bow. So just as a note, a purple team is not a team per se. It's not really someone's job title. It's a ethos and way of working where someone may still be red team, someone may still be blue team. It's just a way of changing how they think and how they interact with each other. When everything works well, the purple team system is relatively simple. You, the attackers locate a vulnerability, they exploit the vulnerability, they work together with the blue team to say, where are the gaps in the logging and or mitigations and work to remediate it together. They resolve the issue and then they train the staff on what happened, how to detect it and look for similar things. Some silos have observed working the application security. The red team testing the applications may know how to attack the applications. They can run tools against it and look at what the results are, but they don't necessarily understand the underlying work. They may not know JavaScript. They may not know Python. Some silos have observed working in application security. The red team may not know. Some silos have observed working in application security. The red team may know how to attack applications, but they don't necessarily know how they work under the hood. They may not be familiar with the topology on the network is, whether there's a WAF, whether there's load balancing that might be affecting the results and they don't necessarily understand how some of these can skew the results. The blue team can see the attacks happening and they can respond to alerts if there's alerts going off, but they don't necessarily know how to differ differentiate between the severity of different types of attacks, whether something is a, su a successful SQL injection attack that needs to be acted on immediately or just noise on the internet. And <laughs> some silos have observed working in application security. The red team may know how to attack applications, but they don't necessarily understand what's going underneath the hood. They may not understand what the network topology is, whether there's things like WAFs or load balancers that may be throwing out the results. And as a result, they may not be getting the results they think they're getting. And this can skew whether something is a true or false positive. The blue team can see the attacks happening. They can respond if alerts are going off inside their de detection engines, but they may not know how to differentiate between a successful and unsuccessful SQL injection attack. And that can be very important in responding to a real world attacker that's important versus spending time on something that's just noise from being on the internet. They may not know the difference between the impact of SQL injection cross-site scripting and how to prioritize as another example. Developers, for the most part, they just want to add the features and keep the system relatively stable. That's typically what they're incentivized to do rather than building for security. So I'm not going to talk too much about the developers, but definitely keeping them in the loop about what is effective, what makes the attacker's lives harder, it can be really important. DAST, dynamic application security testing in a nutshell. This is the easiest and cheapest way to do application security testing. You may know it from tools such as Zap Proxy or Burp Suite, where you're doing black box testing against an application. You do a little bit of heuristics looking at what comes back in responses for things like a vulnerable JavaScript library, or whether it's got headers that indicate that there's a vulnerability. But for the most part, it's fuzzing. And I'm not using fuzzing in a complete garbage sense here. But just fuzzing is, in this context, is throwing inappropriate inputs at the web application and looking at what comes back and trying to guess whether there was a successful attack based on that. So you may be throwing in special characters that trigger SQL and looking to see if there's a SQL error. And once you find that, you can go ahead and actually do a successful attack using it. You may be putting in special characters that create JavaScript, which lets you do a cross-site scripting attack. But the key point, it's all about interacting with a server, saying it's something that the server is not expecting, that it handles in an inappropriate manner, and deducing that there's a, there's a vulnerability that way. Because it's doing all these tests blindly, it can generate tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of requests to the web server. And almost all of those are going to show up as something offensive if you've got a well-tuned web application web application firewall. It's really noisy and it's really easy to spot if you run it at a normal speed. If you're doing it in a stealthy fashion, you can do tests here and there and get very slow results back without necessarily triggering a whole lot of intention from the defense, but you can't get good coverage of an application. So typically you just point it at an application and go and then there's the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of requests that I mentioned. Why DAS needs improvement? So I'm going to do a little comparison between DAS tests and attackers. A DAS test, in my experience, is typically run for one to two days. 
It's mostly, if not entirely automated in that fashion. There's def there's longer attacks that are, do use DAS tools that go on for a week or longer. They're done with more hands-on tools. I tend to think of those more as an application pen test than what I think of as a DAST, which is more of the automated testing. And it's mostly separate tests for discrete issues. It doesn't typically look at how different things can be chained together. So a very common thing is you might have cross-site scripting that on its own doesn't seem that important, but you can use that to grab the session cookie from an administrator and use the administrator's access to upload a web shell or do something else that executes commands on the server itself. The automated tools don't typically do that. And if you've got a very limited period of time, you may not be able to spot it, even if you're doing some hands-on. Attackers, on the other hand, they've got as long as they need. As I mentioned, I work for large organizations that get a lot of attention from the various groups known as APTs. I've worked in banking, I've worked in major publishing, I've worked in a major university. They're interested in what companies like that have. And even if you're not a giant financial institution, even if you're not a giant university, you'd be surprised at some of the businesses that these companies are going after. Things like ransomware on the uptick, and if your company has millions of dollars and that they can get them out of you for, by blackmailing you with your files, you are now of interest. The attackers can combine the automated and manual testing. They can find that interesting little grain of, oh, there's a cross-site scripting vulnerability, what can I do with it? And then they combine the different vulnerabilities to achieve their goals. If you work hand in hand, you can test smarter. So as part of OWASP, you may be familiar with Durbuster. It's, if you're not, it's a popular tool that guesses files and directories based on really common file names and extensions. It breaks through security by uh, security. It can be a standalone tool or a lot of the functionality is built into Zap at this point. And there's other similar tools that just say, I know that there's a bunch of like slash tests, slash images, et cetera, and we'll just go through and brute force. But if you're working with a defensive team, why spend time doing that when you can just work with the blue team and look at the actual file system and enumerate what's there? Rather than spending time that you could be spending doing more intelligent hands-on testing, cheat and take advantage of the fact that you've got access to the system themselves. In addition to looking at the file system, you can do things like scrape the web logs for non-obvious files and paths. If you, depending on how your system is configured, there may be things that don't exist on the file system but exist as a valid path. So by combining the two, you can start making sure that you've got full coverage in your testing. Another example, SQL injection. SQL map is a great tool for detecting and then doing exploitation of SQL vulnerability. Se Smarter SQL injection. SQL map is a tool that many people are here probably familiar with. It's a great tool. It's used for finding and exploiting SQL injection vulnerabilities. But again, it generates thousands of requests. If you've got the ability to work with the blue team and just say for the temporary time during the test, go ahead and turn on the database for both logging and look at everything that's flowing to the database, you can get better results, especially for things like blind SQL injection than you can get just using an automated tool. And just to clarify here, I'm not just talking about gray box testing. Both of the examples I just gave would be an example of just working with the gray box to open up some visibility into what's going underneath the hood. I really want to stress that it's not just having the blue team do stuff for you, but interacting with them and making sure that they share information that they know about the web application that you may not have visibility into. The people who actually do the operations of the system, they too will have some concepts about what might be vulnerable, some things that keep them up at night worrying about it. If you get on board and talk with them, they can give you some really valuable feedback. And similarly, as a tester, you can give them feedback about this is what made your life harder. This is what made your life easier during the test so they can make it harder for the real world attackers. And purpling problems. I just had to go back to the word because it's so terrible. Problem number one is extremely noisy. As a result of these hundreds of thousands of requests, the IDS, the WAF, et cetera, they may be bypassed a specific rule. They may be tuned out on that system or the analysts just may not be looking at it. This makes sense because it'll drive them crazy, crazy trying to pay attention to all those events, or you may be charged by the event or by the amount of data flowing to your SIM. To solve this, when you do find something that's exploitable, go ahead and re-enable everything, make sure that people are paying attention and rerun just the successful part of the attack. You don't need to necessarily care that the noisy stuff that's not working is paid attention to. You wanna make sure that they're able to pay attention to and spot what does work. Problem number two, it's often tested, applications are often tested in non-production environments that don't have the full instrumentation of a production environment. In some cases, they may not be monitored at all. So you may have separate test infrastructure and it may be a separate test WAF that may not have the same configuration as the main infrastructure. It may not have a WAF at all. To 
to solve this, again, it's very similar. When you have something that works, replay it in the production system to see if it's detected and acted upon. In some cases, you don't actually need to attack the production infrastructure. So if you have a dangerous vulnerability that could cause a production outage and you don't want to be running that against the main server. But if all you're doing is tuning a WAF or a IDS IPS, you can simply send those packets to a server that's not vulnerable. All that, really, all that those detection capabilities care about is that the offensive tool comes through the wire. So the fact that the server itself is not vulnerable doesn't matter. But now you've been able to tune and look and see whether your production infrastructure detects and or responds to that attack. Problem three, the blue team may not be successful, trained to successfully differentiate between successful and unsuccessful attack. So a big part of why I started speaking in the first place is I had SOC analysts coming to me asking things like, are we vulnerable to the one equals one attack? And I'm not criticizing the SOC staff. In this case, the problem was we weren't providing good training to them and we weren't making sure that they knew what SQL injection it was, what the implications were and how it works. There's a big difference between a SQL injection attack that the WAF or IDS spots that has a 500 response and a 400 response because in both of those cases, something went wrong and the attack probably didn't actually trigger. The SQL server probably did not actually run anything. But if you're getting a successful looking SQL injection attack and it's getting a 200 response, that's something that's pretty dangerous that really needs investigation. Making sure that you work with both sides so that you have a, you as an attacker have access to the web logs and they as the defense have access to your knowledge of what did and didn't work will give them the knowledge to start differentiating between the noise that's just part of being on the internet at this point because you're going to be attacked 24 7 pretty much and what you actually have to care about as a SOC analyst. Problem number four, the testing may be testing the security infrastructure, not the actual application. So in this case, you may have a WAF that the pen testing team is unaware of and it's detecting, mitigating, blocking what's going on. And so you're running your test and you're not getting anything back in your results. So it, you give it a, okay, everything looks good result. The application itself could still be vulnerable. And if the attacker finds a way of attacking it, bypassing the WAF or coming in through a different way that it doesn't get monitored by the WAF, then you're vulnerable. As such, during the test, the blue team, if they see something that's being completely blocked by the IDS, IPS or WAF or something, interrupting the test and saying, hey, I don't think that you're getting the results that you think you're getting. This can be really important. It saves everyone's time and helps reduce the actual vulnerabilities. Make sure that you're testing what you think you're testing. In some cases, you do want to be testing through the WAF, but in other cases, if you're trying to test the application itself, you want to make sure that you've got a straight path through and it's the blue team that can guarantee that. Problem number five, the blue team may actually not receive, receive the test results. There can be a lot of siloing about who gets what results. So the results may go to management, the results may go to the dev team to fix the problem. But if you're not telling the blue team on a regular basis, hey, last month during our testing, we found three different SQL injection attacks in code that was produced by team Foo. They don't know to look at other applications that was written by that same team because people reuse code all the time. There may be vulnerabil vulnerabilities in the application that didn't get tested as part of your testing that they can say, okay, because we've got the situational awareness of what was found, we can go ahead and make sure that we can look for that vulnerability and other code that may be affected. A big concept of purple team engagements is automation and repeatability. If you, if you as an attacker can make it easy for the blue team to repeat the attack, it means that they can do things on their own. They don't always have to come to you again and again for help. This can be as simple as right clicking most parts of burp and you can just export it as a curl command that they can then use to recreate the attack. It frees up your time as a penetration tester, it allows the developers to test it independently, and it helps the blue team, they can take those exact same roles, like I said, they can point it at a server that doesn't have to be vulnerable, and you can still use that to, to tune the WAFs. When you're following up to make sure that the vulnerability was patched correctly though, always use a SIP, slightly different attack. In some cases, developers will do things like look for one equals one specifically, if that's example, and two equals two will work just fine. So definitely make sure that you switch it up to make sure that they didn't just fix that specific case, but they fixed the root problem. As part of the purple process, I definitely advocate pushing left, integrate the SAST and dynamic application testing early in the development process. This lets them fix it easier and faster in the development process when it's still fresh in their minds, but also make sure that those results go to the DAS team and the blue team. So if a developer does make a mistake, you know, I'm not criticizing the developer, it's, it happens, but make sure that both sides are aware that that did happen so they can look for some way things elsewhere. 
and work hand in hand to make the real attackers' lives miserable. The red team can give valuable insights into what slowed them down. So a great painful idea that I love for implementing to make attackers' lives miserable. If you have WAF rules that trigger only on very, very obvious attacks, so literally the one equals one or the alert text box cross-site scripting, if rather than just blocking that, you redirect that to the logout function of the web application, that means when someone's running an automated scanner against you, every time they do something that's a completely obvious 100% guaranteed hit as something malicious, it kills the session they have to go log in again. If you set a limit on how many times you can log in an hour, that limits them. And also if it gets painful, they may just go find someone else who's got a weaker business to attack and leave you alone for a while. Immutable file systems are great for this. If you can make your file systems so nothing can be written to it, that eliminates the ability of doing things like web shells. Going through and making sure that as an attacker, I know that a lot of people just have a single default account for read and write access to the database, or it can read every, every single table within the database. If I tell the defensive team, hey, if you restrict write access to only a few pages that need it, and if you make sure that only a few ta the tables have the real information, really valuable information, that no nothing other than the pages need it, then if I do get in a, a prior to testing, the blue team can give feedback on what the highest risk applications are. They tend to know where the bodies are buried and what's really valuable and what's not. They know where they're seeing real world attacks that may need to be validated and make sure that there's not something that's actually exploitable there. They know the topology of the monitoring protective systems of the network. So they can say, if you wanna make sure that you're attacking the application itself, use this IP and this host header rather than going through this host name, which may be going out through CDN and through some defensive infrastructure. They know where coverage gaps are. So there may be some cases where they know that there's a gap that they want help proving it and they may not get traction until the pen test report lands and says, using this gap, we were able to exploit the system. So they can give feedback on that. They have the information on the applications, what application platform it's running on, what language it's written and what database program it's running on. There's no sense in spending time doing MySQL attacks if it's running on Oracle or vice versa. They know what the compensating controls are. So they may be able to say, okay, so this is a high risk application that probably has some vulnerabilities, but it's locked down to just these 10 IPs within the organization. So maybe we should pay attention to something that's internet facing instead. The AppSec team can give some feedback to the blue team on what the strategy for the test will be, what the techniques, tools, and procedures are that are used to bypass those defenses. And that will give the blue team the ability to start looking for those TTPs and start tuning to try to detect them. During the testing, the application security testing team can provide feedback on whether there's true or false positives, indicators on what to search for. So if I say, hey, I just got this attack to work, did you see it? Starting something vague, it lets them start looking at the logs, but doesn't tell them what to look for. But if they're spending time and not finding it, I can give them more useful information and make sure that they're not just spinning their wheels. I can give information on what's the really successful, meaningful parts of the test. So there's a lot of tools that will generate a lot of findings that really aren't that important, but are included in reports as like informational by providing context on, okay, this may be rated as medium, but I think I can chain it together with this other medium, this other medium to make it a high. I can give that context to help them understand the bigger picture of the risk. The blue team can provide information on what the test looks like in the logging systems. So in some cases, a test may be overwhelming the server itself and it may just not stop responding very well. And you can get true or false positives because of that. That information can be really useful to the red team and say, okay, maybe I need to throttle the attacks more, down more. Maybe I need to start, stop doing this particular thing that's causing instability so I can make sure that the other tests do run successfully. They can provide information about environmental factors that may be affecting it. So if there's heavy load coming from something else that may be impacting it as well. After the testing concludes, the AppSec team can provide additional feedback on the modern results, what they thought did work and didn't work as far as catching them. They can provide the limited retesting in the production environment. If the test was being done in the test environment, they can do that retest in the production to see if there's still the vulnerabilities there and or if the detection works better there. They can help write their detection rules if necessary. They can help recreate the attack so that you can feed information to the SIM so you can mark what this is what an attack looks like and show it to analysts inside the SIM. They can give a blue team oriented read through of the results. You don't need to tell them everything about the application vulnerability necessarily, but giving them the high picture, big picture view of what happened and what you found can be really useful for them. You can give assistance doing threat hunting. So if you found a significant vulnerability that someone else might've exploited, you might wanna stop and actually threat hunt and see if someone else has found that same vulnerability and working hands in hand 
can be really valuable there. You can do the follow-up with the testing to validate that, the that any mitigations were done successful. You can also set up learning environments. I think it's a great idea to teach the blue team to do some of the offensive work because it helps them better understand it. So setting up a cyber range and doing hands-on lessons on how to do something like using Burp Suite, how to use Zap can be really valuable. The blue team can do validation of the findings. So there may be cases where the attacker thinks that something works successfully, but the blue team has access to the logs and can say, okay, it looks like it worked successfully, but we can prove using the logs it didn't. Working together, you can make sure that that incorrect false positive doesn't go into the report that management sees, which makes everyone's life better because the red team doesn't want to give bad results and the blue team doesn't want to be shown as having had failures. Working together can help solve that. They can give a sign off on the report. So you don't want to have the blue team able to completely block a report going out. But again, if they th think legitimately something is a false positive, making sure that they have some ability to add a gate before it goes off to management can be really valuable again for both sides. And they can work to improve the instrument, instrumentation to plug gaps. So if they find that there wasn't visibility into network segment on the IDS, they can make sure that that gets resolved. For managers, I'd like to say, stress working on together and think holistically about reducing risk to the enterprise rather than just reducing then one side winning or losing. Very often I've seen that the red team will have a completely different management structure than the blue team, particularly in large organizations. And so they may be working to much different goals as far as like their performance evaluation or bonuses depend on. If you make working together the priority, you can get the better results that actually make things more secure rather than just finding vulnerabilities or saying that vulnerabilities don't exist or got closed. Wrapping up, again, think in terms of increasing collaboration, the ways that your different teams can work together rather than opposition. Think in terms of reducing risk rather than discrete tests. So a single test in, test in and of itself isn't the big picture. 10 tests taken singularly are not the big picture, but building a big picture with both the offensive and defensive team looking at those 10 tests and figuring out, okay, how do we remediate and close these gaps and how do we look for what else might exist based on these results is what gets you the best results. Think in terms of pushing application security both left and right. It's not enough to just put things in the CI pipeline you have to make sure, especially at the large enterprise scale, that your defensive staff is skilled at responding, detecting, mitigating, et cetera, attacks. Take every advantage you have against your attackers. Like I said earlier, there's the old truism in security that the, attack, that the attackers only need the defense to mess up once to be able to get in. But think in terms of things like the cyber kill chain or the MITRE attack framework. Most attackers don't just want to get onto a system or have a very simple attack work. They want to get ransomware, they want to get PII, they want to get your private files. If you think in terms of detecting them at some point before they succeed in their goal, rather than simply in terms of stopping that initial detection or that initial attack, that's where you're gonna get the best value for your company. Questions, thoughts, you are welcome to hit me up on Twitter. I have DMs open. If you do a tiny bit of OSINT, you can figure out my email addresses or during the event, I'll be available for chat during this. Thanks for your time.